Hey, welcome again. Glad that you're with us today. Before we uh, get underway this morning with the message, I just want to remind you that we send out updates throughout the week, just um, telling you what's going on here and some devotional thoughts along the way. It's a great way to stay current with what's happening here at SRPC. If you're not getting those updates for some reason, just email us at info at srpc.org, and we'll make sure that you get on that list and are receiving those updates. Yesterday, in our Saturday update, I sent along a, a copy of Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. Uh, those of you that received it, I, I hope you've taken a look at it. As I've been looking and reflecting uh, on that letter, I can't help but be amazed by how relevant it continues to be today uh, to our country, to the church, and for us as individual believers, followers of Jesus. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that, especially uh, tomorrow as we remember MLK and, and all that he did for our country and the civil rights movement back in the 1960s. And Julie and I are actually going to spend some time tomorrow and use that letter as a prompt for us to pray for our nation, the church, and our lives individually. I'd invite you to do that as well. You know, we said this a couple of weeks ago, we oftentimes think of prayer as sort of a, a last result, almost a, a resort, almost a passive thing to say, well, we've tried everything else, let's pray. But that's exactly the opposite of what prayer is. Prayer is inviting God's power and presence. It's inviting God's kingdom and will and purposes into a real situation. So tomorrow, if you would join Julie and I in praying and using that letter as a prompt, we believe that God can make big moves in our country, in our church, and in our lives individually as we use that letter as a prayer prompt through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray this morning, and then we'll launch into our new series. Pray with me. Jesus, you invited us to come to you in prayer. And you even gave us the words to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And among those words are, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come in all of its character and attributes into our world. Your kingdom of truth, your kingdom of compassion, your kingdom of justice and mercy and love. And that that kingdom would be demonstrated in acts of love and service by your church and by your people. We thank you, Lord, for this time now, for the opportunity to be in your word and to learn what you have to say to us today. And so we invite your presence and your spirit to be with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every one of us has a need for rest. We, we have a need for restoration. These days, we have a need for healing and wholeness and being made right in so many ways. Whenever we feel that sense of need welling up within us, our instinct is often to find a place and go there. Maybe that place for you is a mountain cabin where you can just sort of break away from it all. Maybe it's a, a beach house where you can walk the beach and hear the crashing of the waves. Maybe it's taking a hike in the woods and just getting out in the wilderness where you don't hear cars or traffic or anything but God's beautiful creation. <laughs> Maybe your idea of a break is a long nap on a warm day by a pool. Whatever your idea of, of getting away and going there is, I want to remind us that while those things are good, those solutions, those places of respite and restoration are always only temporary. They never really fill us in a sustainable way. What we really need is not so much a place to get away, but a way to get filled. Restoration and recovery is more about soul work than scenery change. And so that's what we want to be talking about throughout this whole series. This series is about soul work. It's about getting ourselves filled up in a sustainable way, so we will discover who Jesus is and in Jesus be strengthened for whatever journey God has us on. Jesus himself actually in extended this incredible invitation to us. He offered us himself. Jesus Christ, think about this, offered to be our there. 
He himself offered to be our place, the person to which we go to be filled up, restored, and renewed. I want to read to you his invitation that comes to his followers, you and me, today in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Here's what Jesus says. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. That's the invitation. The, the place of deepest rest, the, the place of restoration is actually in the presence of Jesus. Come to me. That sounds great, doesn't it? But it's almost the opposite of our version of the Christian faith. It, it's almost the opposite of our version of Christianity. Our version of Christianity often is more about doing things for Jesus than being with Jesus. Our version of Christianity is often about behaviors and, and works and, and expectations. Our version of Christianity gets us wound up in doing things for Jesus instead of being with him. So we end up feeling this sense of weightiness. We get loaded down, we, we get burned out, and we get burdened. And then we lay our version on other people too. You know people who have left the church because they felt judged by other Christians. They felt judged by their behavior. They felt judged because of their politics. They felt judged because of struggle they had with sin. For whatever reason, they just weren't meeting the expectations. The bar wasn't being raised in their life high enough. You know people who've left the church because of that, because we've transferred our version of Christianity into our relationships and expectations of other people. You know people who've gone off to school as college students and, and left their faith behind because they've grown up with a version of Christianity that was all about rules, and then they got into this environment where there were hardly any rules at all, and they decided to, to just leave the rules of their faith, and they figured that that was leaving Jesus too. And I want us to know that this is not a new problem that we have. Religion is about, at its core, is about rules and behavior. But Jesus Christ stands distinctively different. Jesus invites us into relationship, not into a set of rules. Jesus invites us to be with him, to get away with him. He says, get away with me and you'll recover your life. So I want to read this passage again in probably a more familiar translation, the New International Version. And as I read it, and after I read it, I want to take you through some different things that, that remind us more deeply of what Jesus said and, and what it means for us today. So hear these words again from the New International Version, these words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now Jesus, when he shared this word with those that were gathered around him that day, he, he had a target audience in mind. And the, the target audience that Jesus had were people that were working hard. People were working their religion hard. They were taking their religion seriously, and they had found it over time to be a grind. They wanted to please God genuinely. They, they wanted to, to help people, but they were discouraged because they were having to try so hard to meet so many expectations, to raise the bar of their lives so high in an effort to be pleasing to God. Let me ask you this, is that you today? Is that your version of Christianity? If it is, Jesus is inviting you to something different, something better, something refreshing. The next thing Jesus says, it may be a bit off-putting when we read it at its surface. He says this, take my yoke 
upon you. Now, a yoke is a work instrument, something that ties two animals together so they can work the field. Yoke is a work instrument. And if you're discouraged and tired and, and burned out on religion, as Jesus says, you, you probably think, I don't need a yoke, I need a mattress. Right? I, I need to rest, I don't need to work. We'd rather hear Jesus say, you know, take a vacation. Get away to that cabin or that beach house. Take, take a week or two or as long as you need. We'd rather hear Jesus say that, but Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Now, why would Jesus offer tired, worn out, burned out people a yoke, an, an instrument of work? Well, here's why. Jesus knows that the most restful thing that he can do for people is to offer them a new way to carry life. I want to say that again. Jesus knows that the best thing that he can do for weary people is to offer them a new way to carry life, to carry it in tandem with him, to carry life in partnership with him. Jesus goes on to say then, after he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, listen to this, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus wants to be our teacher. But notice he describes his character, gentle and humble in heart. He, he doesn't describe the content of his curriculum. He, he describes his character. He says, learn from me, for I'm humble, gentle and humble of heart. My daughter Courtney has been teaching school for seven years. And boy, the last year and a half, you know the challenges if you're a teacher that, that you've experienced in the classroom and, and online. But we've had multiple, dozens, probably hundreds of conversations about uh, her teaching over these past seven years. And um, I can count on less than one hand, probably three times, I can count when Courtney has expressed frustration over the content and her delivery of that content to her students in school. Very rarely will she be frustrated by content delivery. More often than not, in fact, I can think of probably dozens of times when Courtney says, you know, I'm so frustrated because today I was impatient. Today I, I let myself get frustrated. Today I was too quick to react to a student. Courtney knows what every great teacher knows. She knows that character comes before content. And Jesus knows that too. You see, Courtney knows that when character, that character wins over students, and when her character wins over students, the content is better received. You know this too. Think about the best teacher or teachers that you ever had in school. Chances are it was not about their content first, at least. It was more about their character. It was about their person. It was about their manner. It was about who they were as people before the content that they delivered. And who they were as people made you more able and receptive to understand and enjoy that content. But they led with character. Jesus knows that same thing. Jesus knows that it's character first. That's why he says, learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. That's my character. Think of the best teacher or best teachers that you have ever had. They are, in, in your experience with them, it is just a glimpse of the kind of experience that you will have when Jesus is your teacher. Come to me, Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you. Learn how to do life with me. Learn from me because I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. That's what Jesus invites us to in this conversation. So if your version of Christianity has been more about doing for Jesus than being with Jesus, I'd like to invite you this week to hit the restart button to reboot, if you will, your relationship with Jesus. And the Bible gives us a great picture of what it looks like to start up or restart a relationship with Jesus. If you go to the very first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, 
we see what happens when Jesus initiates a relationship with people. Let me set the stage and then I'll, I'll, I'll read a couple verses for you. This happens in John chapter 1, and John the Baptist is, is doing his ministry. John has collected disciples, followers of his, who, who understand the heart of God, who, who are drawn to, to John's passion, and, and they follow John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and he's there with a couple of his followers, and he says to his followers when he looks at Jesus, John says, look, there's the Lamb of God. And immediately after John says that, these two disciples that are hanging out with John begin to follow Jesus. They just start traipsing behind Jesus. And now let me pick it up with some of Jesus' words. Here's what happens. Turning around, Jesus saw them following, and he asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Now, here's what we learned. If you want to restart a relationship with Jesus, what you have to do first is you have to let him ask you a question. And the question is, what do you want? What do you want? It's how Jesus started a relationship with those disciples, and it's how he starts with you. Jesus starts with this question. What do you want? Jesus doesn't start with, okay, now that you're following me, here's what I expect. He doesn't start with, here's what you should do, here's the, the list of rules, here's the expectations, here's the, the ladder that you climb. He starts with this question, what do you want? What do you want? If you are patient enough to answer that question, God is going to do something fresh and new in your life. You see, it's really a personal question. And the reason it's so personal is because you matter as a person to Jesus. It's not about this set of rules and expectations. It's not about all the to-dos and the what-ifs and how can I get more and do more and all that. It's about you. And so that's why Jesus asks, what do you want? When I allow Jesus to ask me that question, here's what I said. I want to be a good pastor, Jesus, and I want to build a strong church. I, I want my kids to be successful in life, and I want them to thrive. I want to be healthy and able-bodied for a long time. I want to be secure in my retirement. That's, that's what I want. And here's what I know about putting that out in front of Jesus as, as I did. When you sit with Jesus in those questions, Jesus will begin to show you the deeper desires behind those questions. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to get at. Jesus wants to get at the deeper desires behind that question, what do you want? And so here's what happened to me. Jesus gently pointed out that your deeper desire, Mark, in all these questions, in all these things that you want, and you told me you want, your deeper desire is for love. Your deeper desire is for security. And you're trying to find love and security in places that are not guaranteed. They're just not. The way your kids turn out is, is not guaranteed. The way your resources hold up is, is not guaranteed. Your expertise at your job is not guaranteed. Your, your health, short-term or long-term, is, is not guaranteed. You're trying to find the answer to your desires in things and places where there is no guarantee. But here's what Jesus said. My love for you is overwhelming and unchanging. My love for you is the thing that makes you secure, not only in this moment, but forever. That's why I came. That's what the cross is all about, to secure you in my love, not just today, but through anything that happens in the life that you're living, you can be assured of my love for you. You can be secure in my love 
for you. So, Mark, you told me what you want, but let me tell you what you need. You need to know my love. You need to know that you're secure in it. You see, that's what happens when we come to Jesus and answer that question, what do you want? And then think more deeply. Now, I'll, I'll say right out that that's a scary journey, and I'll tell you why. Because it feels like I'm relinquishing control. Control of my career, control of my physical future, control of my re It feels like I'm relinquishing control, but here's the truth. I was never in control anyway. And neither are you. Identifying your deep desires leads to deep conversation with Jesus. Now this week and every week in our series for the next four weeks, I'm going to invite you to take a spiritual practice, to engage in a spiritual practice throughout the week. One practice for each week. A and so here's the spiritual practice for this week. And by the way, we post an outline every week on our website. You can get that and the spiritual practice is, is baked into the outline. So the spiritual practice for this week is simply this. Set aside five to ten minutes each day this week and pay attention to this question from Jesus. What do you want? What desires, what wants come quickly to mind for you? Because you have them. Maybe like me, they're for financial security or, or health or good things for your kids or success in your career. What things come quickly to mind? What, what desires come just, boom, right to the surface when you answer the question, what do you want in front of Jesus? And then sit with this. Is there a deeper desire that these questions point to? Is there a deeper desire? You know, if you sit with Jesus in those questions, Jesus gently, humbly, graciously will begin to show you the deeper desires of your heart and ultimately will show you that he alone is the one that can meet them. But we have to go through this practice of, of bringing to Jesus the things that we desire, the things that we want, and having him help us understand what's even deeper in that desire than seeing that he is the one that truly can meet it in the most fulfilling way. And what that requires of us <laughs> is just to be quiet and to listen. To listen to Jesus gently speak to our souls. Now, you don't have to fold your hands and close your eyes and sit still while you listen to God in prayer. You can listen to God on a walk. You can listen to God on a run. <laughs> you can listen to God hitting golf balls. <laughs> you can listen to God anywhere. You can listen to God in quiet contemplation or in journaling or sitting in a comfortable chair or sitting outside on a warm afternoon. You can listen to God anywhere. You don't have to have your hands folded or your eyes closed. But I'd say this, don't be discouraged if you get distracted, or if you don't get answers right away. I'm such an impatient person, and I get frustrated when I don't get answers right away. I get frustrated when I, when I get distracted. And here's what I've learned. This is a spiritual practice. It's not a spiritual achievement. I'll say that again. This is a spiritual practice. It's not a spiritual achievement. So give yourself grace. God does. You ought to as well. I want to close today by reading a poem, a, a poem that, that's really helped me lean into my relationship with Jesus in a new way. It's a poem that talks maybe about where you might be right now, but also about the adventure of having a new beginning with God through this spiritual practice by sitting with Jesus and allowing him to refresh your soul. It's a poem called For a New Beginning, 
by John O'Donohue. Here's how it goes. In out-of-the-way places of the heart, where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside of you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered. Heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, wondered, would you always live like this? Then the delight, when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plentitude before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning. This is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm for your soul senses the world that awaits you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for invitations. They come and go through our lives. And yet, this invitation from Jesus stands apart, so distinctive, so unique, so powerful. Lord, we pray that it would compel us this week to step in to the whole world that awaits us in deeper relationship with you. God, I pray that you would forgive us for reducing our version of faith to a task list and reducing who you are to a task master. Instead, I pray, Lord, that you would free us up to come to you and to tell you what we want. And in doing that, Lord, I pray that we would hear from you the deeper desires that you've identified in our hearts. The desires that, that we look to have met in surface kinds of ways and temporary sorts of places, but desires that you want to fully and robustly meet in the deepest places of our soul. God, I pray that we'd be okay sitting with you this week around those questions. That we'd be okay with minds that sometimes get distracted and with lack of concentration sometimes and that we would even be okay with not getting an answer right away. Lord, by your grace, your gentleness, and your humility, remind us that this is spiritual practice not spiritual achievement. And so let us rest in you. We thank you, Lord, for this time with you and with your word. We just pray that we would willingly respond to your invitation today and this week. In Jesus' name.